for me being here in Portugal, it's a uh, I love this place and I come as often as I can. Most of my education is in the past ten years where we're in Portugal. So for me having this particular game is a great privilege. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm a professor at the Bullion University uh, and I give most of my study that are related to infiltration issues. But basically, if I'm not understood, just ask from where for them. Ask, ask. And I'm from uh, the Sugarman Institute for Water Research. It's uh, part of the Google University. And actually, it is a campus with, uh, with several other institutes. Uh, and this is the, uh, the view from the back of my, uh, my building. So there's no fire hazard. It's bone dry desert. Maybe there is a 30 millimeters of rain a year. Okay, so this is the area. But our studies are all over. We have in this institute about um, uh, around 90 faculty members with uh, more than 200 uh, students, PhD and master, about 100 master stu uh, PhD students. And, it, uh, and, this, uh, and we have the uh, Institute for, for Physics, for, um, for solar energy, for agriculture in the desert, for microbiology, for variety of things. And I deal mostly with groundwater ecology. And so being here on sabbatical, it means that I left at home a couple of students, seven students, four PhDs, and three, and three master students, uh, which are now on their own because I'm on vacation. If someone wants to know more about this institute, here it is. But uh, I'm here to talk about the about the uh, agricultural impact on groundwater quality. Now, how these are related? Usually, they are not related. They are related, but in reality, people dealing with agriculture care for the production. They need to produce food as fast as they can, as cheap as they can, and as good as they can. And do it, they do it here over what we see here. This is what we see on their surface. But in most parts of the world, whether they don't have the Teju River or the Colorado River, they need to care about what's happening underneath. Because if you make a cross section, underneath there is the groundwater, and in most places around the world, like in Israel, you provide the 95% of the fresh water, in Denmark 100%, in France about 75%, in the US about 65% of the water comes from groundwater. Not all, not all, all of us have the Teju River. And the quality of the water reaching groundwater depends on whatever is infiltrating from above. And whatever infiltrates from above happens to go through the unsaturated zone or the vegetal zone. It starts in the root zone and then slowly, slowly go down until it reaches the groundwater. So there is a strong link between them. The problem is that not often we can tie immediately what's happening here with what's happening here. And there is a tiny difference, tiny link between them. So whenever we want to see what's the link between <coughs> agriculture and groundwater, just, just for, the, for reference, we hear a lot about groundwater pollution. We hear about chemicals, about the industry, about the petroleum industry. But 85% of wells shut down, uh, production wells, or drinking water wells shut down all around the world is because of nitrate, not because of other emerging contaminants. And nitrate comes from here, from the root zone. So agriculture is responsible for most groundwater uh, well shut down. So this is a fact that we, we need to, to address, though we don't want to acknowledge it, because we need the agriculture and we need the water. So what do we often do in order to investigate? This is the, uh, is the, the common methods. So usually we do a lot in the wood zone. Those of you who deal with agriculture or environmental issues with agriculture know how to take soil samples, put sensors in the soil to measure water content, to measure tension, to take soil samples, to make some, some uh, uh, extraction for the soil and, and, and do whatever we can do in the root zone. But this is the root zone. The root zone may be flushed in a single rain event or single irritation, can take all the chemistry one step down. 
And one step down, it doesn't really matter anymore. The next thing that we do, we know that there is some contamination issue. We usually do a drilling rig and collect soil samples. And out of these soil samples, we make extractions. These are usually people who will do this will be people who study it or have the background in soil science, usually people like you from, from with soil science uh, 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 background. And out of these, usually they will make uh, some kind of an assumption according to the chemistry. What's the link between here and here? But this provides us only a snapshot in time. We know the situation here now. We don't know how we got over there. We don't see anything about the dynamic of it. We don't see how it changes with time. And we don't see where it's going to. It's a picture. It's like taking a picture of the sky, see cloud there, and you say with that what's going to be the, 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 the weather in 10 years from now in this area. It's impossible. Okay? The other method relates on observation wells. This well is called the Holy Land because there's many holes there. So there's a lot of monitoring wells all over. And with these monitoring wells, we usually collect water samples, send it to the laboratory, get some results, and out of these results, we try to understand what's happened. But by the time we see that there is some contamination, it's already too late. It means that the aquifer pollution has crossed the unsaturated zone and reached the groundwater, mixed with the huge buffer capacity of the groundwater, and by the end, it's already a contaminated aquifer. I usually say that the contaminated aquifer is a dead aquifer. The chance to remediate an aquifer are very, very, very low. So if we want to protect the water, we cannot rely neither on that or solely on groundwater. Today, every project that got the risk for groundwater contamination, the regulator will come and say, we want as many as we can observation wells. But think of it. Observation well to the groundwater to monitor pollution. But once you monitor pollution, it's already just a post-mortem for this aquifer. And this is not good enough. So what I thought, long ago, if you, if you want to know what's the link between the surface and the groundwater, we must have some kind of a system that will situate continuously the unsaturated zone between the source and the groundwater and monitor continuously both the hydrological process but also the chemical composition of the water as it's moving from surface to the groundwater. And, and the only reason for this seminar, according to my perception, is to convince you that it is possible to measure it's possible to measure how fast the water is moving down. It's possible to measure how, what is it carrying it on the way down. It has some, and I won't go into the nuts and bolts of it, but it has every point like that has uh, some, some sensors to measure changes in water content. Water content in the unsaturated zone, it's like the pressure system in any machine or any hydraulic system. When you want to know how the hydraulic system is working, you need to measure the pressure in key point. In the unsaturated zone, it's measuring the water content because the water content is the driving force for water to move in the subsurface. And it has also has the capacity to measure, to collect liquid sample. Liquid sample is similar to tension isometers or suction cups, but these are a very big one. You can see the picture of it. It's, it, it. It allows to collect liquid sample even from very dry soil, like 8% water content is enough to get the liquid sample, and then you can analyze it for whatever you want. Uh, we've been using, this is a simple for a, an example for one sleeve like that goes under a dairy farm. It's about 50 meters long. Go from the surface to the groundwater, which is about 40 meters below the, the land surface. And uh, 40 meters is about 16 stories building, for those of you who need to, 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 to understand how it looks like. Let's skip that. And by the end, this is what's left. We have the system in the unsaturated zone. We have a control panel on top. And the control panel keeps providing information continuously. Uh, in fact, we have to go usually different direction, different angle. Every point measure continuously. And we get the flow pattern and the chemical composition that is moving down. We've been using this in a variety of uh, setups from floods 
this is in the Andarax region in Spain, this is in South Africa, some in Israel, uh, some uh, uh, agricultural setups from dairy farm. This is Clensium Sandium by where my parents live. Uh, uh, dairy farm already said, even from landfills. From the top of the landfill, you see the leaches generation in this heap of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of waste. What kind of what, what is the risk for groundwater contamination from the leaches generated in the in the heap? Uh, remediation and people tend to think it's very com complex. I will explain. This is, for instance, one week project. Uh, it's only a few years, but installation in, in California a year ago. In one day, I mean, the, the sleeve is prepared for uh, on, on the ground. We send it ready for installation. In the same day, we drill a hole, install the sleeve, and the next day, we already have the control panel set up, and the data is already sent to the air. So it's about a few days installation of such something that looks grandiose, but it's not. And uh, now I would like to show you uh, what kind of data the system is producing. And before we go, before we go into the agricultural aspect, I'd like to show the essence of the, of the, of the data from a simple, uh, simple example. This is from a project that not to do with agriculture. It's flood water, uh, we get a flood water uh, rich up in our environment. Actually, it has a lot to do with agriculture. Because in all these areas, the agriculture totally depends on groundwater. And the groundwater is dependent on the flood water that comes from a day or two a year to recharge or replenish the aquifer as well. So, uh, here, is a, here is a setup the stream channel, the unsupported zone, the groundwater below. Uh, this is a picture from the side. This is a, actually, I'm a little cheating. This is the south. In, uh, the picture is from a site in South Africa, but the data is from Namibia. But this is more than, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so we measure the flood stage. This is the river stage over time, which is, uh, like everybody did before, as we see a flood comes from about two days with a maximum of about one and a half meter. But what we care for is this process, how fast the water is moving down. For measuring how fast the water is moving down, we install the system uh, and we measure changes in water content as the wetting front is moving, is moving down. What we see up there is changes. Okay. What we see is changes in water content. This is the y-axis over time during the flood. And you see different uh, hydrograph in different depth, from depth of 58 centimeters all the way to 4, say, 4 meters, 4.5 meters. And you can see changes in water content. We see that the beginning, probe number one is changing its water content, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. And according to these changes in water content, we practically get the velocity of the working front propagation down. More than that, if we get the velocity and we get the, the level of change in water content, this is the flux. Okay? So knowing the velocity, knowing the flux, this is very important aspect of, of infiltration, whether it is agriculture or not. Uh, we can also, this is another setup, this is a, a, an experimental setup under a pond. Well, we measure propagation of traces. For those of you, each of these curves represent a breakthrough curve of a chemical component installed in one of these rings. So we see when these traces arrive to what depth in what hour. So we can see the propagation of it. Without getting into details, because we can argue for hours the meaning of that double peak or why is it coming here. All I want to show is that we have the capability to measure the chemical composition of the water as it's moving down. And with this tool, we can go to the agriculture. I will show another one example which is important. This is in the Sandon area, it's supposed to be the cleanest one, a 
according to our data, there is no agriculture, no animal industry, only rainwater by the city of my parents live at this point, and my father lives somewhere here. And, uh, and uh, what we see here is the rain pattern during 2005-2006. By the way, this station was installed in 2003 and still working as is until today. So the kind of data I'm showing now is continuously going on here today. This is the rain, cumulative daily rain, and I will show results from one of the streets, I'm not sure if it's three or two, but that's really one of them. What we can see here is changing water content in depth of 60 centimeters. This is the other problem you can see up there. And the cross section is sand, then clay, then sandstone, and so on. What we can see here is the first rain event do not impact much the water content. Then we have a strong rain event, and we see a change in increase in water content. This is classic, everybody has seen this before. But if we go deeper to 1.4 meter, we see that once the one in 60 meter is draining down, the one in 4 meter, in 1.4 meter is gaining up. And we can go further on to deeper. And we can see that once at 3 meter is draining down, the one at 5.5 at meter is getting its water. And then you can see these pairs of sensors as they propagate down. Now, we can do that all the way down, even to deeper one, and we can see how it passed the clay, go to the sand under the clay, and propagate it now. And this bump here is the change in water content in depth of 21 meters. Actually, this is the touchdown of the rainy season as it's propagated to the unsaturated zone, and this pump is right here. So the water is over there. So we know where the water is right. Now for the agriculture, I'll skip that. These are some conceptual issues, important one, which means a lot about the validity of the samples you're taking, but this is another issue because I really want to go into the agriculture. And now for the agriculture. Now that we have a system capable of measuring the infiltration process and measure the water, the quality of the water is moving down, we went into agricultural field. At the beginning, very naively, this test system was installed in 2008, still functioning until today, it's already nine years. Uh, this is an open field crop. At the time, it was a, it was a Cereals, mainly rain fed, no, no irrigation at the time. This is 18 meters deep, 18 meters, it's four stories building more or less, uh, all the way from the surface down. And what we can see here is the variation, the blue bars, sorry, from the beginning. Each box is from different depth. The other one is 1 meter, 2.7, 4.2, 6.3, blah, 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 all the way we're going down to 80 meters. This is here. Okay, so each represent, each represent that. The blue bars are the seasonal rain. So it's from 2009 until 2014, the, the seasonal uh, rain, the winter rain, winter rain of 2010, 2009. 9, 11, 11, 12, and so on and so on. The red points are the concentration of nitrite in these cells with time. So what we can see that in the beginning we see a dramatic increase in concentration at one meter, right here, reaching almost 3,000 milligram per liter of nitrate, which is huge. But then we can see that it's dropping down. If we were farmers, or we were from environmental department, and we see this decrease, we say, okay, nice, probably the plant consumed the nitrate, and it's disappeared. But if you're a hydrologist and you go down, you can see that once it's dropping from above, it starts gaining 2.7 meters. And then you can see it a year later at 4.2, and a year later it was a stronger rate. And then you can see it at 6.3, 9.5, and all the way to just above the water table, at about 18 meters, where it was 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then bumping up to high. So you can see how a single event from some kind of, a, I would say, mal 
use of, uh, of, of, of uh, fertilizers created a pulse starting in the surface, propagating down to the groundwater, and you can track it over several years. So you can see something moving before it hits the groundwater. And the reason is the application of, uh, of, uh, uh, of waste from dairy farms nearby on this field. We can go, I, didn't want, I don't want to go now to the reason for that, but this is a normal application of uh, for fertilizers or manure from, from dairy farms over, over, over fields. So we can trace exactly when it starts, what was the reason, and how it goes on. Now to a different project. There was an area in Israel where, uh, during 2008, there was a strong development of, uh, of organic farming, what you call here bio, bio. Bio, it's supposed to be good for everyone, for earth, for the stomach, and for, for the, not for the pocket, but for the, for the mental thing of uh, for some people, think it's good. And we wanted to compare organic and conventional farming in the sense of not how nice it is, what is it doing to the soil? So we went to a couple of typical farm and installed these systems under the farm. These are organic greenhouses usually used for, for what we call salad, uh, salad fruits, it's uh, cherry tomatoes and cucumbers and whatever. And we installed this system now that these are commercial farms, not experimental farm, commercial farm with real farm and they need to produce food and have good life for their own families, so they need to have, to have enough money from them. So this is this is the, the reason to make food, to make money, to sustain living. This is this is how farmers work. And uh, since the system is installed in the subsurface, it doesn't interfere with the daily life. They keep on working, do what they need to do. But this is down below. This is comparison of the irrigation pattern of the organic and conventional. They both use the exact same amount of water to grow cherry tomatoes in the same time. Okay, it used to be in the same time. Establishment irrigation, this gives a constant amount during the whole season, and this gives something that dries up and they don't, but in general it's the exact amount of water. Okay? Also, they use the same amount of uh, N fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers, in both farms, grow the cherry tomato. This one organic is using only organic matter like compost, and this is used partly organic because it's good for soil treatment. But most of it is not. Part of it is from commercial fertilizer, so it's more or less the same. And this is the result. This is the concentration of nitrate in the soil in the conventional farm. You see very high concentration in the top layer which is the root zone, very important for the, for the plant. <coughs> but very low concentration below the root zone, which is as it's supposed to be, so the plants are consuming it. And this is the picture under the organic farm. You can see the values of concentration reaching 600-700 mg of liter per liter of water moving down. This is a bomb of nitrate moving down under the, 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 the organic farming. And we tested it compared, to, we compared several, and this is more or less the picture we see of, uh, under all organic farms that we measure. These are, these are intensive organic farming. This is not a, a backyard farm. This is intensive organic farming. Low concentration in the root zone where it's supposed to be, high concentration under it. And the reason, I mean, we can, we can start using now, since we have the capability to collect it with sample. We can uh, do isotope analysis and see where's the smoking gun and see what the, this nitrogen, the nitrate that we see here and we see here relates to what? So we can have a tag for the nitrate where it's coming from. Uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't go into it, but I was a little bit cheating because there was one organic farm that had the cleanest. Uh, uh, soil, they have the lowest concentration of, uh, of nitrate. And it appears to me that it's not organic versus conventional, it's the way the fertilizer are implemented in the soil. 
And if you are comparing solid fertilizer like compost in the soil or manure, compared to liquid fertilizer, there is substantial difference between the two. So it's not organic versus conventional, it's solid versus liquid. And the reason is that you are all aware of that. When you need to grow organic, you need to put that in the soil before plantation or before the plant has the capability to take all the nutrients from the soil. So when you apply water, it goes down, nobody can use it. But when you go conventionally and you use drip irrigation, then the plant, you don't need to give the plant any fertilizer when it's that age. The farmer will not waste money on putting fertilizer in that age. He will wait for the plant to grow and it will end the fertilizer according to the demand. Now, uh, we want to use this data in models. So we wanted to see how change of the practice on the soil impacts the subsurface. We had one father that used to grow cherry tomatoes, and after a while, he, the land swept owners, and there came another owner that preferred to grow leaves, lettuce, and celsius, uh, and some others, okay? So, here are the results. The blue line represents the conditions during the tomato season. Then, once we switch crop to lettuce, we start to see this increase all the way down. And this increase is actually propagating, we can see this is profiles, and we can see this in different depth, like in depth of 2 meter, 6 meter, actually it's already in 15 meter rising up. So you can see how changes can make it. Now, you might say, okay, this is a bad farmer, he's using too much nitrogen, he don't know how to grow these things, he probably is using too much nitrogen. So we went, I would skip the isotopic issue just to proof of concept that it's actually walking this way. Unless you, I mean, you can see uh, through the isotopic composition evidence for, for, for how it's moving around. But I want to practice to, to focus more on these issues. We took the soil as it is in the beginning, before the greenhouses were planted. And we took the recommended condition for growing tomato as they are recommended by the, by the governmental recommendation. Bureau, I would say, I don't know the name. But someone is recommending the farmers how to grow tomatoes and how to grow uh, lettuce. We took these conditions and applied them in a model that is based on the data that we found. And what you can see in this, in this, uh, uh, the the, wide, the, 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 the strip that we see there is the model area. With, uh, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with some, some arrows around it. And you can see that the measured result, more or less, though it is rehydrogenated, though it is in real soil, though it is in two different stations, more or less stay on the same line. Which means that the farmers were doing well and they were just doing what they were told to do, what they're supposed to be according to who? According to people like you, advising the farmers what to put in the soil in order to grow lettuce. I mean, you it means like consultants, because I guess most people from these faculties will be consultants or professors in one way or another, because the farmers need our input. And this is, this is the input, and these are the results. So, we have a uh, kind of proof of concept, this is not just out of the blue. It's there, and the problem, the nitrate problem, is related to the way it is implemented in the soil, and there is no need to wait 30 years between implementation and finding that there is a problem in the groundwater. We can track it from day one, or day two, we are now on day two actually. But we can, we can track it, we can see how changes in, in uh, like the, when I'm talking to, to, to Usayo, there are some areas that have moved from, uh, from intensive farming to, to uh, what was pasture. 
And we're expecting to resolve. Well, we can track this result because of the change that we are doing, we can track this in real time and not wait 15 years to something happen in ground water. Another one, before we are starting to wonder if you lose, lose attention, because this is more or less time, uh, there we found impact on ground water. We also know that every cow has two sides, one side is white, the other side is black. We like the white side, but the black side is on the ground and usually can create a great problem. So we wanted to check how this problem is real. And sometimes in there we found they have some kind of lagoons for the liquid manure outside. And this lagoon is usually kind of an earthen lagoon, even not lying, just outside waiting to dry or waiting to whatever happens. It just stays there. So we went down to these lagoons. And installed system under such a such a manure lagoon that is here, and even under stream channels that divert this uh, lagoon, this the water from the from the dairy farm to a lagoon which is far away. And we want to investigate what's happening down there. Is the, we have real contamination from the dairy farms. And this is a, a you saw the picture with the long sleeve. This is actually in bed side. This is 45 meter deep. What we see is something that uh, this kind of data I already saw before. Three years of continuous measurement. Year one is the rain of year one. It's winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, and so on and so on. And these are the measurement of water content at different times and different depths. The upper 12 meter, actually here it is, uh, no, this is uh, because of the, the PDL, the, the PowerPoint, there are some changes here. Actually, the result of the black one there is related to this one here, so it's a little bit deeper. But then, you know, the first 12 meters of the unsampled zone, it's dense clay. 65% of monoclonality clay. The heaviest clay we can find. This is practically put water, nothing moves through it. This is according to the textbooks. And here are the measurements of water content we've done. What we see, that almost every significant rain event Past the entire clay layer almost instantly. And we, when we study soil science, we learn that clay got low hydraulic conductivity. When you go to model it and you use any model, the first thing they will ask you the model, what is the hydraulic conductivity? If it is clay, you will go, you measure it yourself, or you go to the textbook, you take clay properties, hydraulic conductivity, whatever is needed for the model, toss it in. But in fact, it's almost instantly water is running, this black one is actually in the sand under 30 meters of clay. So water is actually moving through the clay almost instantly. And you measure it in one season, in one rain, in another rain, and then better, and sometimes even in between rain you, you, you see that. Okay? So how comes water is passing through the clay so fast? It's supposed to be, you know, you have these uh, uh, sensitivity zones. Sometimes in this sensitivity maps you will see clay, clay soils kind of known as really protected or more safe compared to sandy soil. And the reason, or before the reason, when these PhD students said, said it's not possible, it can't be, it's clay, this data, I cannot explain this data, I cannot publish this data, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting, I'm going to do a lot of PhD. And then we took all the data from all other students and put it together. Now the data from the other student was data on infiltration in uh, seven dunes, which means the depth and the time of arrival of the working from each point, different location, different time, different events, sometimes different years, representing depth of the arrival of the working from. You can see that here, from the data here, in the same room that I showed you before, it takes about uh, 100 to 1,000 hours to reach 6 meters. If you go to uh, Coros Alluvium, in a desert area, where you have flooded water, like a stream coming in, flooding water, it will take uh, 1 to 10 hours to reach uh, 4 meters. And also another experiment in sandy ephemeral river when you have uh, 
flood coming on the surface flood of 3 meters, it will take uh, 60 hours to reach 4 meters. And this is the claim. It takes hour, 10 hours to reach depth of 10 meters, the fastest of all we know. And the reason is simple. Is that any one of you who have seen clay soil know that when it's dry, it tends to get cracks. But in fact, it will always stay flat because clay soil, if it is not saturated, completely saturated, even if you go down from 65% to 60% water content, 60% to 55% water content, it's already cracked. And if it's cracked and it's above the water table, it will always have this. And I mentioned this has been published in a few others. So when you track these structures, you can see that even during winter, when it's closing a little bit and you have a lot of vegetation, the deeper parts are still active. Why am I saying this? Just be careful when you apply um, your understanding about soils, clay into infiltration process. Because if it is above the water table, it's not saturated. If it's not saturated, it has four orders of having higher water content compared to anything that So, after this long story, all I wanted to show is that we have the capability to measure continuously whatever is flowing in the soil, below the root zone. So if you are, if you are thinking about something that happening in the soil and you want to measure its potential impact on one water, you can measure it. This is one system, there are others, but it's not, it's not something that you can leave someone else with, with, with solve. We can measure the uh, 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 pollution process can be identified in the weather zone before groundwater. We don't need to wait for groundwater to be polluted and say, ah, we had a problem. We can measure it in real time and know before we make post mortem to the aquifer. We can use it uh, irrigation and, and, and fertilization efficiency can be controlled on the basis of real time because we are now measuring in the root zone, we measure a lot. But we don't know what's happening moving from the root zone down. We can use that for that. And where comes the, the benefit? The farmer can have accessibility to data on, the, on lots of agricultural input, fertilizers, water, whatever they pay for to put in the soil. And for the water authority, Authorities, it's the capability to get an early warning on pollution potential. And to my knowledge, 35 minutes is beyond the capability of most people to. If anyone wants more information, I will be happy to give. Thank you, Walter. I think we have some time for debate.